So thank you all for coming out today. And um, I am perfectly open to questions at any time. There's no need to hold them. Just raise your hand. So I envision what we're going to do today in two parts. Uh, the first part is a centering practice that is the basis for a lot of the work that I do when I'm teaching my psychic and spiritual development classes. And I think it's a helpful transition into any kind of inner work. And it requires some visualization. And one of the reasons why you have uh, notepads is to make notes of the particular images that come up for you. Um, in the afternoon, we'll be doing some uh, inner sense work with the chakras. And I can't guarantee that everybody will have experiences doing that, but I can give a lot of tips to, for people to experiment on their own uh, with the techniques that we talk about. Also, uh, with my book, The Multidimensional Human, which is based on some of the things that I teach in my classes. And then there are a couple other good resources um, for working with the chakras that you can do on your own that I'll recommend. And uh, we'll probably go a little more quickly than people might be comfortable with. And I want you to be patient because uh, the most interesting stuff I have to say is about the sixth and seventh chakras. And if we start with the first chakra and get stuck on the fourth and then run out of time, we don't have a chance to talk about that. So don't feel anxious in that early part of the afternoon if it seems like we're going too fast. Um, we'll get to the point where you'll understand why. Because the, the first five chakras are pretty much all the same in terms of what the work is that you can do on them. But there's a special kind of work that needs to be done with the sixth and seventh. And I just want to make sure that there's an opportunity for us to talk about that. So um, for about 15 years now, I've been leading classes on psychic and spiritual development. And the practices I'll be teaching today are ones that have been generated in those classes. I have an inner teacher who works with me in producing the uh, practices. And um, this inner teacher, I, I call him Charles. That's sort of just an easy way of referring to him. Um, he doesn't really have a name in the sense that we normally have names. And uh, over these 15 years, Charles has helped me produce a stack of practices that's about this high, if I were to type it up. And um, I'm very interested in the possibility of offering these two, because normally I only work with my local groups in Boston. So. Um, I would like to, yes. It's been interesting, though. Um, publishers have not been too interested in that kind of thing. So I, uh, I'll have to wait till somebody actually asks me to do that. So let's start with a centering practice, then. So um, for those of you who have had some exposure to theosophical teachings, there's something called the Seven Principles. And I'm going to refer to this very briefly because it's the basis of the practice that I'm going to teach. But you don't have to know or memorize the names that I'll be using. They're in Sanskrit. I'm merely bringing this up to show that the material that I'm teaching has a strong resonance or with or basis in theosophy. So what we'll be working with is a state of consciousness that I call the witness platform. And this is a neutral state of consciousness that will help you separate yourself from anything that might be going on in your head that may be making you nervous or upset or angry, anything of this nature. Then we'll be working with a second state of consciousness that I call the limited self. And this is the part of us that we carry with us through all of our life as a kind of accumulation of everything we're not happy about and everything that has disappointed us. And uh, for some of us, we've made peace with that. For some of us, it's off limits. For some of us, it's this thing that we drag around behind us everywhere we go. And um, the idea of including it is to recognize that there's work that needs to be done in this area, but it also can interfere with inner sense work. And so we'll find a way 
to honor that it's present and then gently remove ourselves from it. And then the third state of consciousness that we'll work with is called the unlimited self. And this refers to the part of us that precedes our lifetimes on the physical plane and that uh, is not really affected by the kinds of things that we're disappointed in in our personal life. So in the theosophical teachings, I'll just move over here, I put the words up on the board so that people would have a chance to at least see what they look like. Um, this is our, I'll just put LS for limited self. And it consists of four parts, the shtula or dense body, linga or subtle body, which is the model body that creates the, uh, the physical form, that holds the space for the physical form to develop. Prana, which is life force, and kama, which is desire. And then the unlimited self is made up of manas, which is mind, buddhi, which is intuition or a kind of spiritual consciousness, and atma, which is our highest self. So I'll just put U-S for unlimited self. The witness platform comes with a Sanskrit word that is probably less familiar. It's not one of the seven principles, uh, but it represents a bridge between this lower self and this higher self, and it's called antakarana. And it's, uh, it's a, ne a neutral state of consciousness that helps you remove yourself from the troubles that are stored over here and open yourself to the spaciousness that's available to you over here. So as I mentioned, I'm not going to emphasize any of that. It's just to let you know that there's a theosophical basis for the practice that we'll be learning. Um, I'll probably stand when I'm lecturing and sit when I'm leading you along the lines of the practice. The practice is pretty simple. The first thing we do is we develop an image for our witness platform. Now what I have found in the work that I do is that if you have an image that represents a state of consciousness, it's much easier to pull in that state of consciousness and experience it just by remembering the image. And the more often you use the image, the more often and easier it is for you to get into that state that the image represents. So the thing about the witness platform is it's emotionally neutral, and it has a strong sense of support underneath you. I'll explain when we're actually doing the guided visualization meditation a little more about that, but that's the basis of the witness platform. It pulls you out of whatever you're normally involved with in your thinking and your feelings. The second state of consciousness, the limited self, is going to be related to the witness platform by being off to the left. So that's why uh, if you think of the Antakarana as the witness platform, if that's the witness platform, you're going to be looking off to the left to find imagery for your limited self, and you'll be looking off to the right to find image for your imagery for your unlimited self. So the imagery can be something that you know from your personal life, for example, the unlimited self can show up for people as a, a favorite um, place to go in nature. Um, but you can also use an imaginary place or a place that just shows up when you ask yourself inwardly, can I have an image for this particular um, aspect of consciousness? So um, we'll be doing the practice in two rounds. The first round is just to get the imagery. And the second round is to explore the actual feeling that's connected with that a little more deeply. So the last introductory thing I want to say is I want to respect differences in people's ability to use inner senses. And there are a couple of factors that we need to keep in mind with the inner senses. The first one is <clears throat> the mind often interferes with inner sense information. And the way it does that is it it conceptualizes something. So if you see a picture of a chakra in a book, and I say to you, look for a chakra, 
the first thing you're going to ask yourself is, what was that picture I saw? What did it look like? Was it green? Was it red? Did it have a deer in the middle of it, like the Sanskrit ones? And then whatever is going on with your inner senses is going to be lost in all of this mental spinning. So it's something that people have a different level of ability to separate themselves from. And we'll be patient in this process. If you're getting stuck, if you're having some trouble conceptualizing things, let me know because I may be able to help you free yourself from that and move forward from it. Um, the second issue is there are three qualities in my experience. Um, this is something I've learned from Charles, my inner teacher. There are three qualities of inner sense experience. Uh, it's as if inner sense experience can be read three different ways, and each of us has a particular way of reading it. So you can read it as energy, you can read it as information, and you can read it as consciousness. So think for a minute about how uh, there are scientists who say that light can be experienced as uh, a wave or as a particle. So in a sense, this is the same kind of thing. The wave would be the energy, the particle would be information, and the consciousness part is the part that science can't measure and, and leaves out, but that theosophists and people in the New Age think is real. So what I've discovered in teaching my classes is that people have a natural mode of experiencing inner sense information. It is either along the line of energy or along the line of information or along the line of consciousness. It may come up in our work today which of those types you are. So the mystics uh, are the ones that have this response to energy. My experience with them is they have such a strong desire to experience God consciousness or lifting up out of the world and leaving all of it behind and light, light, more light and also a strong sense of truth that they're not really interested in imagery. Now all of the practices that I do involve imagery, so I have fights, so to speak, with my students who are mystics to try to get them to realize the imagery and the language can actually be useful, especially when they want to talk to somebody because, you know, the problem with a mystic in, in my experience is they say, oh, it expanded and it twirled and it opened and there was more light and I was lifted and everybody else is scratching their heads because there's nothing really tangible or informational about that that people can take with them. And yet, the mystics have a stronger sense of truth consciousness, I guess you could call it, of any of these three types I'll be talking about. So the second type is the type that I naturally gravitate to and that's what I call the clairvoyance. And they deal with information and imagery. And so if you're a very active dreamer, for example, um, probably you're tending in the direction of clairvoyance. The wonderful thing about clairvoyance is there's a lot of information that you can gather from your inner senses. The challenge is, if you're not also somewhat connected to the truth element, you'll never know what any of it means. And I have students that I struggle with sometimes along this line too, where they have very fluent imagery and they'll go on talking about the color of the wallpaper and the texture of the carpet and all of these things without realizing that some of that stuff may just be there for background. It's not specifically important information. They have no sense of what's true or useful in what they perceive. And uh, they also have a tendency to take things literally. So a characteristic problem of people who have near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, if they're clairvoyance, is they'll say, the uh, roads in heaven are paved with gold. And they'll mean there's a road in heaven and it's paved with gold. They won't realize that the energetic aspect of that might be there is a path of some kind that will take you someplace. It may be immaterial, but it'll feel like a path to you. And the one that's right for you will light up and look gold because it has value for you. So for the people who um, are very fluent with clairvoyant imagery, the thing they need to learn is how to understand the imagery. 
And I may be able to help people with that if you share your imagery and don't necessarily understand it. And then the third type I call clairaudience, and they deal with the consciousness aspect. And the thing that's vital for them is the feeling of relationship. So um, any of you who have explored spiritualism will recognize that the spiritualist is often a clairaudient type in the sense that they deal with consciousness. They're very interested in the relational aspect of things. They may also have trouble with the truth connection of things. And so, you know, if any being shows up, it's got to be grandma. You know, it could be a very deeply loving being, just like grandma was a very deeply loving being. But it could be an angel, or it could be some other type of being. And often there isn't an ability to make that discernment. So the idea is, in the training that I do with people, if you know your type, that's helpful. If you've got one going, you've got some degree of psychic awareness. What you need to do is add a second one to become more accurate, and then eventually add the third one, which is a significant challenge. So for me, I started off dreaming and astral projecting when I was a teenager, and that was a sign of the clairvoyant aspect of things. And then somewhat later, I did some work developing myself as a channel. So then I started working on the consciousness aspect of things, and that's where I developed my relationship with my teacher, Charles. And then the third aspect was the hardest one, which was, what does all of this mean? What's the truth content? And that involved a lot of work, and theosophy actually was very helpful. In fact, as I go around to different theosophical groups, what I find is I'm mostly talking to mystics and a few clairvoyants and almost no clairaudience because there's often been a struggle in the theosophical society around people who have a, a spiritualist base. Um, and it's interesting to watch. I mean, I have, I have struggles with, in my classes with people who uh, come from that spiritualist side. For example, I had one very talented astral projector who, whenever he experienced another being, would walk up to it and say, Hi, my name is Mark. And, you know, what's your name? And wanting to shake hands. And the beings would turn their back on him because they realized that here was somebody who didn't understand that everything in non-physical reality, in a sense, is energy. And people don't have names like a spoken name. And that you're communicating via a kind of telepathy that doesn't have letters involved, so that the name Mark doesn't mean anything. So th these are just examples of some of the pitfalls that people can get into if they don't recognize these three different psychic types. Any questions about that? So can you be all three? Or? You can. And in fact, I think Madame Blavatsky is a good example of the kind of spiritual teacher who was able to do all of them. I think she was naturally a mystic, primarily, and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of truth content in her writings. There's also a lot of imagery in some of the uh, uh, records that she was reading from uh, you know, the Akashic or world memory of the past. And then she had the relationship with the masters, which is the consciousness aspect of things. Just to clarify, the, so inner perceptions tend to be energy or info or consciousness, and those correlate with the mystic, the clairvoyant, the clairaudient in, yes. in that order. Or you could also say truth, information, um, no, truth, imagery, and relationship. Okay, thank you. Yes. So I don't understand why you call it consciousness, why that, why that word applies to clairaudience or relationship. The way it's most often experienced is a kind of channeling, and so that's why I say clairaudience. It, the words are probably not the best. For example, I could say that the mystics are clairsentience because what they experience is a connection to energy, but that tends to be used in uh, New Age literature for a completely different kind of psychic experience. So we lack useful words. The important thing is the experience of some kind of relationship, that you are aware of yourself as a conscious being 
and that you are aware of some aspect of non-physical reality as a conscious being. So I'm going to sit down now and uh, we'll move into the mode of doing a little bit of work. And for this purpose, I'll ask that people have their eyes closed, but you can keep your writing materials handy because there may be uh, a little bit you'll want to write about whatever it is that you're perceiving. So what we'll do is we'll gather imagery for each of those three states of consciousness that I was talking about, the witness platform, the limited self, and the unlimited self. Then we'll share a little bit about that, and then we'll go a little deeper into that experience, and then we'll share about that. As far as the sharing is concerned, um, one of the three objects of the Theosophical Society is the exploration of the latent powers in man and, or humanity and also unexplained laws of nature. We're, we're not going to be dealing with unexplained laws of nature, but we are dealing with powers of consciousness. And my understanding of the best way to think about that is clairvoyant investigation, so to speak. In other words, all of us are experimenting. All of us are investigating what are our own possibilities of consciousness. Whatever we share is actually a contribution to the group knowledge, and therefore it reflects another aspect of the Theosophical Society, which is the first object of brotherhood, universal brotherhood of humanity. So some of you may be very fluent and fluent with your imagery. Some may have very apparently impressive imagery. Some may be very simple. Personally, I tend to trust any image that comes that the person doesn't expect. So if um, somebody is looking for uh, a higher self guide and it shows up as Mickey Mouse, and that's the least thing they would expect, I would venture to guess that that has the most interesting information behind it. So um, it often happens that there's a problem of spiritual status that comes into sharing about the inner life, and I'm hoping we'll be able to minimize that. So, um, you know, if Cleopatra shows up in your imagery, that's fine. You know, we'll talk about it in, in share. But, you know, the thing is, if, if you're also talking to half a dozen Egyptian and Lemurian and Atlantean masters, I would say to myself, well, okay, that's what we expect. And there's maybe a little bit of spiritual status behind that. Um, We'll work with it, but be careful because it could be the mind conceptualizing what you think you should be experiencing. So let's have our eyes closed. And uh, this is a basic guided meditation kind of experience. So have your attention focused inward. And you might take a couple of deep breaths the way you ordinarily would if you were beginning a meditation practice. So this first image that we want to look for is an image for the witness platform. It's called the witness platform because it lets you witness your experience with emotional neutrality. And there are only two requirements. One is that it have a solid platform underneath you, which means you're grounded. And the other is that it has a wide sense of view. So here are a couple of examples. On the ocean shore, a tall lifeguard chair, a watchtower, a fire tower, an observatory, the top of a cliff or a high hill or a mountain, a tree house, a castle tower. And as I mentioned earlier, it could be something that you are familiar with as a place in physical reality where you feel at peace, 
or it could be an image that suggests itself. And you can try a couple of them on for size. Just make sure there's something underneath you supporting you and there's a wide sense of view. So take a moment to explore possibilities for imagery for your witness platform. And if you want, you can make a note of it. And by the way, you can't do this wrong. If it helps, find a place of emotional neutrality in yourself, which is a recognizable state of consciousness, and then ask your inner self to show you an image that effectively represents that. And it's often helpful to take the first image that you get as opposed to spinning around from one image to another. (coughs) So have a sense that you're on your witness platform. That can sometimes enhance the feeling of emotional neutrality. And for the next part, stay on your witness platform. Don't leave it. But look off to the left and find an image for your limited self. This can be really awful if you want. It can show up as that, or you can see it as that on purpose, because that helps keep all of that heaviness off in one place. Typically, in my classes, I find that people see the limited self as barren, or a desert, or a swamp, very sticky, or really overgrown. or completely run down. Those are just a few examples. And once again, if you like, make some notes about it. And again, stay on your witness platform. You can turn your attention away from this limited self. Now look off towards the unlimited self landscape or state of consciousness off to the right and find an image associated with that. And there's often a lot of light, a lot of openness, a sense of peace. Some people get carried away with the idea of an unlimited self and feel like they're way out in the universe. You don't have to go that far. And I should mention one last thing, that if you chose for your witness platform a location in physical reality, you don't necessarily have to use that same landscape for a version of your limited self or your unlimited self. It's up to you. And then just take a moment to bring your attention fully back to the witness platform. And let's open our eyes and let's talk a little bit about people's experience. 
Okay, so I had two uh, possible witness ones. One was uh, a beach with sand dunes you know, off a, of a lake. Okay. And the other one was a lighthouse in the same area. Which one came first? The, the beach. Okay. So I would say that probably what you were doing was you were clearing your mind. So the landscape represents the clearing of the mind. But the lighthouse is an excellent witness platform. Mm. So I would, I would use that in, if you continue to work with this practice. Okay. And then, and then something else? For the low, limited self, there was a shack. On, on the left, but I was uh, I was on the beach, so when I saw the the shack, and then for the unlimited, it was either the lighthouse or the lake. The lake uh, is probably a better image maybe. for that, because okay. the thing is the the water is sort of formless compared to the land, and often people have stronger unlimited self experiences if there's more of less of a quality of physicality about it. So I think the lake is a good example. Okay, for my low limited self, I almost said lower self. <laughs> um, or you want the witness platform first, okay. Yeah. That was a high hill in a green meadow on a sunny day. Okay. Okay. And then for the lower self or limited, um, I saw myself blindfolded and it was kind of cloudy. And for the unlimited self, a sunny prairie savanna in spring. Okay. So you saw yourself in a landscape? Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Like I said, you can't do it wrong. But there's often, um, if you know anything about interpreting dream imagery, there's often a message. So the message for you might be something like, there is no limited self except when you blind yourself to, you know, you can't do anything wrong. It all means something. The real question is, what does it mean? Can you yeah. figure that out? Is there someone else who wants to share? Okay. Um, yeah, each of these were less large geographical things. And I tried, let's say, a tower and our hills and things like that. But when I flashed on the stool, it's like a business chair that I sit on every day when I do my job. Um, my feeling of being there is that I'm in control and I, that's where I observe the world really. But it's in, a, it's in a small room and I thought, well, would this work? And I said, well, yeah, I can make the walls disappear easily because <laughs> okay. I'm in control. <laughs> well, when I looked to the left for the limited self, my, the image I got was of myself maybe 10 years ago when I was experimenting, experimenting a bit with gender consciousness. And I won't go into detail, but there's some radical images of myself doing that. And I thought, yeah, that's pretty limited. That'll work. And to the right, maybe 40 years ago, I was carrying equipment across the campus, and I had a vision of an oriental innkeeper who just smiled and bowed to me as a very wise, perhaps, person, I thought, ah, that'll work. So It's often possible to meet a guide of some kind in the unlimited self. Um, it's interesting, in my classes, uh, as I teach these um, practices, they evolve, and we need to have a certain amount of playfulness about them and trust whatever shows up. So, you know, if that image is useful to you as a way of exploring the possibility of inner guidance, go into the unlimited self and have a chat with that figure. Only remember, he's Asian. <laughs> All right, so the very first vision for the witness that popped in my head was uh, like a hangman's galley, I guess you call it. I don't know. It was just like, you know how... When when you when they would hang somebody, it would oh, always the gallows, yeah, yeah, the gallows. Right. Okay, um, which did not feel neutral to me, and I got like this little wave of anxiety, and then, so obviously I 
tried to find another image, but that's honestly what came Have first. Have you ever worked with the uh, Tarot? No. There's a, an image called the Hanged Man in the Tarot deck, which is actually an image of... Oh, uh, yeah, okay. You know what I'm talking about then. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's an image of a kind of meditative consciousness. So you may have been getting a message about that. Um, and it could be something to trust because it did come unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So the image behind uh, the hanged man is that the, the Norse god Odin hung himself from the world tree in order to somehow achieve a state of consciousness in which he was able to understand everything that was happening all over the globe. So um, there's some good archetypal resonance with that imagery. Okay. That's why I brought it up, because I just wasn't sure it felt dark, but at the same time, it, it came very clear immediately. Did you, so, what, what did you try to get after that? So after that, I, I went to a really nice top of a hill where I have a, an actual one that I've been to many, many times. It's where I, I like to stand and you can just have, see a, you have a good view of everything for, you can see all the way to, it's in Bloomingdale, and you can see all the way to the city from there. So I went there, but I, I almost feel like that's not a neutral place for me. It's kind of a happy place for me. Happy's okay. Happy's okay. We'll take happy. Okay. <laughs> so then I the, then I did the rest of my visualization from there. Mm -hmm. That should be fine. Yeah. Uh, either way is good. I mean, it, sometimes the the guides that provide the imagery have a sense of humor. <laughs> so it could be that if there was any kind of um, nervousness about going into doing the practice, that you choked up. So you saw, you know, they they fed this back to you the image of a hangman's gallows. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, my dreams are always full of puns like that. Okay, when you first started talking about the meditation, before we went into it, I immediately got an image for the witness and the limited self. Then when we did the meditation, surprisingly, they flipped. Okay, originally my witness was, I was embraced by a tall oak tree it was very dark and it had hands. It just kind of came up and embraced me. And you were talking about a firm base and it felt very firm. So that's why I had that image. But then when you started the meditation, I got the image that I had picked for the limited self, which was a hike that we had gone on in Shenandoah. And I was at the top of the cliff and we couldn't go anymore. It was, it was like it was limited. That was all there was to go. So then when you did the meditation, they actually flipped. And I realized that the, uh, the witness was the one that was in the tree, embraced by the tree. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The witness was the hike at Shenandoah up at the top of the mountain where I could see all around. And the limited self was the one that was actually in the tree. Enclosed, yeah. Enclosed, yeah. But originally I thought that up on that cliff was limited because I'd hiked as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. But actually in the meditation I realized, no, there was a view. So there was more that I could see. And then for the unlimited self, I just got the picture of a dove, which just yesterday came to my window, which surprised me. So that's why that came in. Okay. So. Um, when we go through the next round, it might, you might want to ask what landscape the dove is flying around in, because the, the challenge of using a, a being as a focal point is that um, there's not a lot of room to move around. But you may be one of those that I was talking about earlier for whom relationship is the important element. So these things show up like that sometimes. Thanks. I just um, wanted to say that when you said to visualize, I have a hard time, you know, like picturing things in my mind. So when I close my eyes um, and I knew I had to have the witness uh, platform and then look to the left and to the right, I really just got uh, words. So it was... Uh, mountain and then forest uh, to the left and then just the horizon to the right. Then as we, you know, as you were going through the uh, meditation, I kind of started to uh, put myself in that place. But really it's just words that uh, immediately came to me, so. Yeah, that'll work fine too. Um, there are a couple things that you can do with, with that. One of them is um, obviously don't dismiss it because it's different from other people's experience. The other one is, um, 
as you develop your relationship with these three states of consciousness, you can say, show me what this word looks like as a landscape. This is typically what I advise people to do if they're more along the um, energy mystical side of things. Have the feeling of the energy because that's natural to you. And then ask a question, so show me what this looks like as an image. And assume that whatever comes up or whoever's doing the showing is guiding or teaching you and will show you an equivalent, something that will work so that you have both the imagery and the, um, the energy behind it. Okay, so uh, we're going to do another somewhat deeper experience with this centering practice and then another round of sharing. Now, it's very important once you decide on your imagery to stay with it. So anytime you use the centering practice today or if you use it beyond today, keep using your imagery. But the images may slowly evolve over time. New things may show up that can signify spiritual growth of various kinds. Or you may also find that eventually at some point some really new landscape shows up, and that's fine. But the reason that you stay with the imagery is if you ever need to get out of your limited self, you've got an image that always represents your unlimited self, and you'll understand after we've done this next cycle why that might be important. So you have your eyes closed and your attention focused inward. And once again, take a couple of deep breaths. And summon up the image that represents your witness platform. But see yourself in that landscape. Really place yourself in the witness platform. And have a feeling in your body, either in the imagery or in the body in this room, of the emotional neutrality of the witness platform. And any of you who are in any way sensitive to inner sense information, just notice what it's like to be in a room full of people who are on their witness platform. And then look off to the left towards your limited self, remember the imagery there, and you have two choices. You can either reach out with your consciousness as if you were reaching out a toe to test the temperature of water and make contact with that landscape, or you can leave the witness platform and go into that landscape. It's a matter of immersion, whatever you're comfortable with. When you're having that experience of connection with the limited self, notice how that feels in your body, different from the way the witness platform felt. And check the energy in the room. Notice how that's different from what you experienced with the witness platform. And then bring your focus of attention back to the witness platform. See yourself in the witness platform. 
withdraw your consciousness, bring yourself all the way back into the witness platform so you're not at all in touch with that limited self. Once again, let yourself feel that emotionally neutral state of consciousness. If you like, take another reading of the energy in the room. And then when you're ready, we're going to do the same thing with the unlimited self. Turn your attention towards the right of your witness platform. Reach out with your consciousness like you were testing the temperature of water with a toe. Or leave the witness platform and go into that landscape. Notice how it feels to be there. Notice how it feels in your body to be there, different from the limited self and the witness platform. And take another reading of the energy in the room. What's it like to be in a room full of people who are in touch with this unlimited self? And this time, as you bring your focus of attention back to the witness platform, you can keep this connection with the unlimited self. And you might notice that you're a little deeper, clearer, and more focused than you were previously, because you've let go of this connection to the limited self, and you've opened this connection to the unlimited self. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes if you want to make notes. Do that, and I'll be interested to hear any questions or comments that people might have about that experience. Is the centering practice the one of standing in the uh, witness platform, or is it's the, the whole, whole cycle? The whole cycle. That's why at the end of it, I was saying, um, notice how your focus is different. Because yes. you've let go of the connection to the limited self and you've opened the connection to the unlimited self. Yeah, very the much. Yeah. The witness platform in and of itself can be centering because it's always helpful to, to be able to step out of anything that's stirring us up into a place of emotional neutrality. But most of us have some connection to the limited self even when we think we're in our best, highest, clearest mood. And if you're going to do inner sense work, it's just really helpful to park that limited self over here, withdraw yourself from it, and be as connected as you can to your unlimited self. So I want to go back to the exercise one so this makes sense, All right. potentially. No problem. <laughs> um, so my witness platform is the Chief, which is this really high uh, cliff and mountain in British Columbia, so at the very top of that. And um, when I looked to the, to the left, the first time I did that on exercise one, and I don't know what this is, so hopefully you can help me with okay. it. I've experienced it a couple of times uh, before, is um, I would have this little purple ball that is in front of my eyes, and then it would just kind of go up to the ceiling, and then another one would come, and then it would go up to the ceiling, and then another one, and another one, and another one. And then the image would come, um, and then the ball would disappear. Um, and so the image was... Um, uh, like thick, thick, um, dead branches that you just couldn't get through. Like if you were trying to cut through them, you just couldn't get through them. Um, and so that was on the limited self. And then the uh, unlimited self side, looking to the right, uh, in the first exercise, it literally was uh, very light, like you said, a um, lot of light. It took for a while, again, the ball, again, and again, and again. And then, um, and then it was like a very manicured mustache and beard. <laughs> So, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, so that was the first one. And then in the second one, uh, went back to standing on the witnessing platform, um, witness platform at the chief, went to the left. When I was trying, 
I put myself into all of the the um, branches and everything, and it felt like I was um, I was trying to like push my way through them. Um, but what I felt in my body when you brought me into that was I felt uh, kind of compressed on the right side of my body, like like physically I felt discomfort and pressure and I actually felt myself leaning to the right in my chair whether I was or not um, and then when I came out of the and my heart started to race a little bit uh, when I came back up on the, uh, the platform it I was able to come up and detach from that um, and then when I looked to the right for the unlimited self uh, very light and then uh, it was very interesting. The um, mustache and the beard um, actually took a little bit more form, and so it ended up being um, uh, Dr. Augusto uh, from um, from John of God in the Casa is what it felt like. And uh, and so he just put his hand, uh, his arm around me, and uh, and then I got really really light, and it almost like this whole right side decompressed, and then I was able to bring that back onto the platform when he brought us back the ball reappeared, the purple one, but it was really big <laughs> in front of me and then still kind of going to the ceiling and then center again and then to the ceiling. But it, before that exercise, it was small and then it was really big. So like, I have no idea okay. <laughs> what any of that means. So, <laughs> Well, interpreting anybody's experience, um, all I can do is offer some suggestions about how to think about it. Sure. Um, Nothing that I say should be considered definitive, especially because this is not a particular image that has come up with any of my classes, but I think I know what it is. Um, the first thing I want to say is um, the way that your limited self landscape shows up can often be an indication of what's challenging for you. Um, so for example, people who have a desert as a limited self landscape Often that means no resources, you know, feeling like you're here and you just aren't getting any kind of support. Swamp is stickiness. Um, what you're talking about, a pile of dead wood that you can't get through, um, that could perhaps be something along the lines of um, too much to do, you know, either clutter or overwhelm or both. Um, I figured that when the uh, image came of the of what essentially is a guide, you know, that um, that's what the mustache and the beard represented. And you know, it got your attention, right? <laughs> and then you explored to find out, you know, what more was there. And it showed itself to you, not necessarily as the particular person, but as a person of that nature, someone who can be um, healing and supportive. And you can use that image, and it may change over time, it may reveal itself in a you know, more personal ways. Um, I was actually going to say something about whether you've ever seen the, the pictures of the uh, Theosophical Masters because they have well-trimmed beards and mustaches. <laughs> so, um, it was very manicured. <laughs> so the last thing is, you know when you um, have just typed in or, or pointed to an internet address and there's some waiting time before the actual address pops up as a website. And there's always some little icon on the screen that's spinning around, and it usually means working. So I think that's what your balls are. Basically what happens is you give yourself a suggestion, and then you watch and wait to see what happens. And something is happening, but you wait till it shows up instead of interfering with it or trying to make it be something and, you know, it's almost like dot, 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 which is like a pause, you know? And I find that um, there are lots of ways in which our inner senses or our inner teachers talk to us through imagery, if we can just figure out what it is. Um, so just another example, um, one of my students would always have a very audible sigh whenever she experienced some kind of shift in consciousness. And it didn't matter that it was a sigh, it was just something that showed that something changed. And so your imagery of the ball probably has something to do with that. And um, as to what it means when it's small and when it's big, that's for you to explore. Okay. Thank you. Um, so 
my witness platform, when I asked for a, an image, um, it, it's, an actual, it's an actual platform, a wooden one, supported on, at the four corners by really big tree stumps. Um, I, I feel, I love, I love the forest, and so that's where it is. It's in the forest, a New England forest. Um, and when I went to the, I got off the platform and went to both places, and the limited self, the image for the limited self is um, uh, an old cellar hole, a place I know from my childhood, an old cellar hole that's, you know, all fallen in and um, covered with leaves and brush. And when I went toward it, um, I got kind of tense, but I was okay as long as I didn't fall in, you know. I could just walk around the edges. Um, and... It was interesting when you asked, to, you know, what does it feel like? I think it was when you asked, what does the room feel like? I got a sharp pain right behind my, my left eye, which resolved as soon as I went back to the witness platform. Where somebody, my feel somebody thumped your third <laughs> eye. <laughs> <laughs> it was so... Well, um, so, so for me, being on the witness platform is just feeling safe. Safety is, you know, that, that's the neutral. I don't feel happy or sad. I just feel safe. And then um, the uh, unlimited self is a mountaintop also from uh, New Hampshire where you can see forever and ever. Um, and that feel, and it's one of my favorite places in the world. And it, um, I mean, you have to expend some energy to get there and then... Uh, it's just a beautiful spot, and and you can see for a long ways, and it feels unlimited, and it, um, uh, you know, and sensing the energy in the room, I don't I don't have words for it, but it felt great. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. <laughs> so there are a couple comments that I want to make about this uh, account, which I think are very um, important to recognize. One of them is that question to check the energy in the room is a very subtle way of opening up your inner senses. Because most of us know that experience of walking into a space somewhere and knowing whether we're safe or not, or knowing whether we're welcome or not, or knowing whether whether anybody sees us or whether we belong or whether we're being pushed out or whether we're not invited. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of information that we gather about walking into a space. And if you conceptualize the idea of what inner senses are, you may miss something like that and not realize you've been using it all the time. So that's the first thing to come out of that, which I think is important to recognize. The second thing is, most people don't think about whatever mood or state of consciousness, consciousness they're in as being changeable. I mean, if you're in a bad mood, you're in it, right? You just are. But we went through these three different states of consciousness in a matter of maybe five or six minutes. And I imagine some of you had pretty dramatic shifts, either inwardly or in your experience of the energy in the room while that was going on. That demonstrates at least that we have a choice, you know, that we're actually choosing to be in our limited self and we could choose to be in our unlimited self. Um, so thank you for the opportunity for me to say something about that. Um, the other thing about um, this practice is that when you're doing it on your own, you may not sense that feeling in the room, but you may still have fairly dramatic experiences of your own moods or energies. Did anybody have a feeling of pressure in the solar plexus area when we were in the limited self? That's pretty common, and that's actually the third chakra, so we're now going to transition in the direction of chakras. That third chakra is very sensitive to energetic atmospheres or ambiences, and um, if you're ever in an unsafe environment or if you're ever under a so-called psychic attack, that's where you'll experience it. 
Okay, so let's go on to uh, a little bit more explanation and maybe one more experience before lunch. So when we're working with inner sense information, one of the things that we need to be able to do is retrieve it and pass it on to our consciousness. And the thing that I have found that's most useful for that is the visualization of what I call energy hands. So the idea is that the energy hands are a way of working with your chakras or any kind of inner sense impressions um, that allow you to actually touch the energy so that you can imagine or focalize your inner senses and retrieve the information that you're getting. Most of us, if we have any kind of psychic or intuitive sensitivity, are drawing in that information and it's just a part of this huge welter of stuff that's going on, including all of our sense impressions from the normal five senses. And so if we have our eyes closed, there has to be a way of focalizing our attention. So the energy hands give us an opportunity to do that. Plus, my understanding is that these energy hands represent a higher level of our own consciousness. Um, in theosophy, the personality is made up of the physical body, the emotional or astral body, and the mental body. Beyond that, the, what we call the soul informally is in, called the causal body, technically, in theosophy. So. I consider that these energy hands come from at least that level, if not a higher level, and that they know more than we do, and there are things that they can show us and things that they can help us do or understand. And probably the most important aspect of the idea of energy hands is that we're open to being shown things by them. So again, we're not inventing what we're seeing, we're watching and waiting for the energy hands to show us something. In that way, we have a, a much uh, greater possibility that we're not deceiving ourselves, inventing imagery, and so on. And what I find, especially for beginning students, is they constantly forget that it's the energy hands showing you something. So if, if I'm guiding you to work with a chakra in a particular way, it's not your head deciding what you're going to do and focusing your attention. It's your making a request of your energy hands to do it. And they'll show you all kinds of things. There's a tremendous amount of learning that you can get. It's almost like drawing in your own master for a particular kind of healing, except it's your higher self. And if you're really willing to watch and learn from what they do, they can teach you a tremendous amount even if you're not immediately aware of or understand what they're doing. So in the next and last exercise that we'll do this morning, I want to introduce you to your energy hands. So um, any questions about that before we start? <clears throat> so we're not going to start with a centering practice again, but after lunch we will because that'll get us um, hopefully out of our digestive and social mode and back into our inner work mode. So have your eyes closed and your attention focused inward. And once again, take a couple of deep breaths. And be aware of the physical body sitting here in this room. Be aware of the chair. Be aware of any outer sense impressions, for example. Just allow it to be there. Don't resist it. You don't have to pay attention to it. Be at peace with it. Now, if I ask you to be aware of the energy field that surrounds your physical body, where does that take you? You could, for example, if, if you don't have an immediate sense of it, you could just imagine that your physical body is surrounded by a globe of light. It could be colored light of some kind. 
Where's the outer edge of that light? Could be very close to the body. Could be a few inches away. Could be a foot or several feet away. Could be as large as the room. I consider this just to be an invitation to your inner senses to see if some information is available. It doesn't matter whether you're perceiving anything or not. The important thing is just asking the question. And if you have an awareness of your energy field, and even if you don't, imagine that there's a pair of energy hands coming from a higher level of your being, resting either on the top of your head or on your shoulders in a way that gives you a sense of peace and support, warmth, maybe even a blessing. If you're sensitive to the energy in the room, notice how things changed when you called in these energy hands. Feel that they have a sense of presence, maybe a feeling of grace also associated with them. These energy hands are here to help you learn and grow and work with subtle energy and your inner senses. They know more than you do. All you have to do is ask them to do something and then Step back and watch and see what they do. So let's ask them to give the physical body a brief pat down from head to toe. Not rapid, like a massage therapist might use, but a gentle, gentle pressing in. Here's your skin, here's your body, here are your energy hands making contact with it. And notice that there may be a relaxing experience available for you through this contact with the energy hands. Starting with the head and progressing down to the feet. And when you're ready, let's take this a little farther. There's something called a grounding cord that you can use to connect you to the energetic core of the earth. Your energy hands know how to make a grounding cord. Using the energy from your own energy field, they can gather it up form it into a cord, and carry it all the way down to the core of the planet and attach it there. When you've got a grounding cord like this, you're saying yes to being in the physical body and on the physical planet. And when your energy hands have finished, let them come back up so they're around you. And ask these energy hands to gather up any unwanted energy that might be present surrounding the physical body in your energy field. You might see it as a color, probably not a pretty color, or you might feel it. The idea is, gather up this unwanted energy, something you may have produced from negative thinking, or something others may have produced by 
having negative thoughts and feelings about you. Gather all of that up. The energy hands carry it down to the grounding cord and you can release it through the grounding cord to the core of the planet where it'll be broken up and recycled and turned into fresh vital life force that you and other people can use. Just ask your energy hands to do this. Know they know how to do it and watch and see what they do. And I'll be silent here for a moment while you experiment with the energy hands in this way. And also be aware that you can take fresh, vital energy from the core of the planet. Your energy hands can bring it up the grounding cord and can spread it around your energy field to refresh all those areas where there was that unwanted energy. When you're ready, you can ask your energy hands to do that too. Pull up some of this revitalizing energy Sometimes it's helpful to visualize it as a vibrant green color, the color of growing things. And they can spread it into every nook and cranny of the physical body and any layers of the energy field that you might be aware of. The energy hands can work very quickly. When you're ready, you can ask them to come back to your shoulders or the top of your head. And take a moment to offer some deep, heartfelt gratitude to this aspect of your higher self, the causal level, or some other higher level of yourself that is helping you understand how to work with your energy field. And say goodbye to them for now. We'll work with them again after lunch. And you're welcome to open your eyes when you're ready. And I'm curious about anyone who would care to share about their experience. Well, that was awesome. Um, I'm familiar with the energy hands from a previous workshop with you, and I I use them. And um, I really, I need to... I haven't done it enough lately, so I'm really glad to be here. It was, uh, that was very helpful and very centering. Um, I find them very, uh, you know, they're a disembodied pair of hands, but what I feel from them whenever I, whenever I remember to call on them is just total compassion and, uh, unconditional love and a willingness to, help me grow. So um, that's my experience with them. I hope everybody else's was as good. I'll share one of mine. I uh, work a couple times a week to remove 
unwanted energy or blockages. And so I was surprised when I saw the energy hands take a chisel and just, you know, break apart uh, some solid uh, energy that was kind of interesting. And then your suggestion to flush it down the uh, was good. It was helpful. There are many things that you can perceive in your energy field, such as some kind of hardened energy. I mean, that could be a rock somebody threw at you, so to speak, of, you know, of not liking, or it could be a, an obsessive thought pattern of some kind, or it, it could, I mean, there are many, many possibilities. It could be something from a long time ago that, you know, needed to be broken down and released and hadn't been found before. Um, if you're interested in exploring some more with the energy hands and in general with this idea of working with energy, um, my book, The Multidimensional Human, has a bunch of practices for doing that. Um, and also specifically for working with the chakras and grounding cords and things like that. There's um, a book called Basic Psychic Development by a man named John Friedlander and a, a woman named Gloria Hampshire. And uh, there's a woman named Carla McLaren also who wrote a book called Your Aura and Your Chakras. Both of these books came from a teaching tradition that was originated by a man named Louis Bostwick who had something called the Berkeley Psychic Institute in California in the 1970s. And um, I don't know a lot about him, but I think he synthesized a lot of information, including some of uh, the theosophical teachings, to produce a set of principles and a set of practices that uh, I've learned a lot from and have adapted and, and um, grown in new directions. So. Um, Louis Bostwick, he never wrote anything, but the Berkeley Psychic Institute was the thing that he produced. And um, I think it still exists as a training school. Someone else who would like to share? I, get, I was given a little homework to be checking in with a few of my chakras, so I'm new to this. Okay. And I have a hard time doing that because I really don't feel anything there. Mm -hmm. But just now, when I was clearing the unwanted energy, it was like somebody went in to my guts and just was kind of churning things around, also in the throat. But it felt much better after it was done. So it was kind of like a, 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 a grab, a twist, and a pull. And then I got some fresh energy. So it was very internal as okay. far as unwanted energy. We'll be doing a little more specific work with the chakras, but you know, a lot of times if you just step back and ask the energy hands to do whatever needs to be healed in your energy field or in your chakras, it can be astonishing to see what they, what they show you and, and how they work. Um, and the more often you do it, the easier it is to sense the energy and also to see the imagery. So uh, for those of you whose imagery may not have been that clear, just remember that the intention to work in this direction starts to open up the pathways that will allow you to make use of the imagery more easily later. 